to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel the of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of and Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. As they went down the road, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. Acts chapter 8, verses 35 through 37. Welcome to our study of cases of conversion in the New Testament. We're specifically looking in the book of Acts, which is the book that answers the question, what must I do to be saved? And friend, we encourage you to stay tuned as we think today, as we open our hearts and minds to the Word of God on this very important subject. As we think about the eunuch's salvation, and as he's in the chariot traveling down the road with Philip, we have to think about all of those who played a very important part in this man's salvation. For example, God Himself plays a part in the Ethiopian eunuch hearing the gospel. Notice Acts chapter 8, and notice what the Scripture says in verse number 26. The Bible records, Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Did God play a part in this man having the opportunity to hear the gospel? You bet He did. God initiated the angel to speak to Philip, and Philip went and told him the gospel. And so God is the architect behind this salvation that occurs. Now, are we saying God's going to come down and speak specifically to us today? No, but in a time when we've got the Bible, is God still behind and is He the one who has a big part in salvation? You bet. It's God Himself who made salvation possible. John 3 verse 16, the Bible so beautifully says, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God made salvation possible, and He's the one who makes that a privilege and a reality for every person. Well, you know, another person, another individual that had a part in this man's salvation was the angel, that angel whom God sent. He says, go and overtake the chariot, and Philip runs to him and teaches him the gospel. God used that means at that time during the age of the miraculous. Now, friend, are we saying that an angel is going to come speak to you and tell you what to do to be saved? That didn't happen then. God still used His messenger. But today we're not saying that's how angels are going to work, but we do need to be warned. God today doesn't speak through angels. He speaks through His Son. Hebrews 1 verses 1 following says, God who at various times and various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. Paul warned in Galatians 1 verses 6 through 9, Even if we or an angel from heaven preach to you any other gospel than that which we've preached, let him be accursed. And so while God had a part, and God still does today in sending His Son. While God chose to use angels to get the message to Philip and to the eunuch, God has used angels throughout the Bible, but today God speaks to us through His Son. Well, who else had a part in this man's salvation? As we turn our attention to the Scripture, we know that Philip had a big part in teaching this man the gospel. Notice Acts chapter 8, verse number 27. So he, Philip, arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship. God said to Philip through the angel, Go over to the chariot. Philip arose and ran to the chariot, ready to teach him the gospel. Philip, God's servant, had a responsibility. And friend, it's that same responsibility that Christians and gospel teachers today have. Jesus said it best. Matthew 28, verse 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then Jesus said, Go and make disciples. That's the responsibility that Christians have. We're to go into all the world 
and teach the gospel. Mark chapter 16, verse number 15. But you know, as it relates to this man's salvation, the Ethiopian himself played the major part in deciding to be saved. Acts chapter 8, verse 27. He was a, a man of authority. He was a man who was heading back home, probably ready to see his family. He was a man who took care of a, a lot of business and a, a very important man, we might say. And yet this man knew there was something more important, something more than handling the queen's money every day, something more than being in the position he was in. There was more to life than that. And the Ethiopian surely knew he needed to obey the gospel. Friend, as we talk about salvation, is it the case that God makes it available? Absolutely. Could someone come and, and teach the gospel? Do people do that today? Sure. But it comes down to the person deciding for themselves what they're going to do. Romans 14, 12 says this, So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. I have to decide. You have to decide. Men have to decide based on their response to the Word of God. Are they going to obey the gospel and become a Christian? And of course, the Holy Spirit played a part in this man's salvation as well. The Holy Spirit brought the Word. Acts chapter 8, verse 29. The Spirit worked through the angel and the Spirit worked through Philip in, in preaching the message and he had a part in that. And friend, as we think about the Holy Spirit and as we think about His part in salvation today, let's realize the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired the Word that we speak and we preach to people today. John 16, verse 13. Jesus said, When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He'll guide you into all truth. He'll not speak on His own authority. Whatever He hears, that will He speak. Jesus was speaking to His first century disciples and He said, when He comes, He's going to guide you into all truth. You remember the Spirit came in Acts chapter 2. They were guided into all truth and by the close of the New Testament, Jude 3 says, we have the once for all faith that's been delivered. Has the Holy Spirit played a part in salvation today? You bet. His Word, the inspired Word of God given by the Holy Spirit, is that which we teach and preach to those who hear the message of God. Now, as we think about this case of conversion, and as we think about what did the Ethiopian eunuch do to be saved, this man first had to hear the Word of God. Look in uh, the Bible in Acts chapter 8, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says about this man in verse 28. The Bible records that this man was returning from worship and sitting in the chariot, watch this, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. What was this man doing that contributed and led to his obedience to the gospel? His ears and his heart was attentive to the Word of God. He's, what a, wouldn't you like to find a, a host of prospects like this? There's a man reading his Bible. Let's go talk to him. That's the kind of person you want to talk to. He's already giving the Word of God attention in his heart. Friend, this is something that each person must do if they're going to be saved. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word truth. Is this man studying? You bet he is. Acts 17, 11, Search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. Where is this man studying? Isaiah 53. We learn that's exactly. He's studying the scriptures. He's hearing about this suffering servant. He wants to know, is this man talking about himself or someone else? And, and Philip, opportunity to preach Christ comes and he does that. A man whose heart is already in tune with the will of God is a man who's well on his way in obeying the gospel. Jeremiah 37, 17. The great question is asked, is there any word from the Lord? And of course, Paul asks a similar question in Romans 4, verse 3. What does the Scripture say? That's what this man wanted to know. What is the word of the Lord saying here? He said, Philip, in essence, says, do you understand what you're reading? How can I unless someone teach me? Come on up here and let's talk about it. Let's study the Word of God together. And so he was reading Scripture and his heart was already in tune with the will of God. As we think about this man's willingness to hear the Word of God, this man has a respect. Not only is he reading the Scripture, he has a respect for the Scripture as the very Word of God. How do we know that? He's been to worship. 
in Jerusalem. He knows who the God of the Old Testament is. He's reading about that God. He's reading about His Scripture. And he happens to be in the point where he's reading about the suffering Messiah. This man respects the Word of God. Friend, if we're going to be saved, we've got to respect the Bible as the very Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says it this way, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man, may, man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do, do we really recognize that God spoke? And not only did the world come into existence, but this book is the very Word of God. If I want to know what does God want me to do, this book is the answer of what God expects me and expects you to do. Now, another great thing about this man in his willingness to hear the Word of God. Here's a man who wasn't easily offended. Now, notice again Acts chapter 8. I want you to especially notice verses 30 and 31. Philip ran to him, heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. He wasn't easily offended. You know, the question Philip asked might offend a lot of folks. He's reading, here's a man reading the Bible. You go up to him and you say, Do you understand what you're reading? What do you mean, do I understand? You're not going to teach me, are you? You think you know it better than me? A lot of people might respond with the wrong attitude. But Philip, all he wants to do is help this man. All he wants to do is point this man toward Jesus. The man is reading about something which indeed is a mystery to this man. Come up here. Let's talk about it. You, you help me see what this is about. If you can prove it from the Scripture, I know he respects the Word of God, so if he can speak about this from the Scripture, he's ready to obey it. We need people today who don't wear their feelings on their sleeve, who aren't so easily offended as it comes to learning the Gospel. Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, and that truth will make you free. Buy the truth and sell it not. The proverb writer said in Proverbs 23, 23, And as Paul said to the church in Galatia, Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Friend, all of us need to be open-minded enough that we can learn if someone's willing to teach us the Scripture. So I'm not talking about teach man's doctrine. We're not talking about teach what's popular or teach what somebody else believes. If somebody can help me to learn what God wants me to do better, Am I willing to sit down and listen? Am I willing to grow? Am I willing to study? And that's a key attribute in hearing the voice of God. You know, as we think about this eunuch and his hearing the Word of God, this man wasn't above being taught the Scripture. Verse 31, how can I unless someone teach me? He invites him up in the chariot. They study the Word of God together. He wasn't above being taught the Word of God. And friend, the right heart, and hearing the Word of God the way God wants us to means that we're not above being taught. I love the words of Luke chapter 11, verse 1. They said, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. That statement, I hope you listen carefully to it, ought to be on every one of our hearts. Lord, teach us. Are we really willing to study and to be taught and to learn? 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, when the Word is preached, preach the Word. Are we willing to let that Word instruct us? If any man speaks as the oracles of God, are we willing to listen to those oracles? Are we willing to be taught by God's Word and be teachable? That's such an important aspect about hearing God's Word. And then, of course, in this man's hearing, he wants to learn specifically about Christ. I want you to notice what he's reading. Look in Acts chapter 8 and I want you to notice beginning in verse number 32. The Bible says, the place in the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his justice was taken away and who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. What did this man specifically want to learn about? He wanted to learn about Christ. He's, he's reading Isaiah 53, and you can see the providence of God at work here. Here's a man reading about Christ. Christ has just uh, been crucified on the cross, and, and men and women are obeying the gospel, and God now sends His servant to teach him about Christ. What a marvelous unfolding of events that occurs. 
But friend, for a person to be saved, you've got to be willing to hear about Christ. That is that He died for our sins. That's what Isaiah 53 is all about. He was led as a sheep before its shearers of silence, so He opened not His mouth. His justice was taken away. What is all that? Isaiah 53 is the picture of Christ and His suffering and His sacrifice and His willingness to die for mankind because He loved us so much. Uh, 1 Peter 2.24 almost verbatim quotes from Isaiah 53. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. By His stripes we are healed. Are you willing to hear that all of us have to deal with the sin problem? Are we willing to hear that we can't save ourselves? Are we willing to recognize I need to know about Jesus and His way of salvation to be pleasing to the Father? You know, there's another thing though that I want to point out about this man that makes it so unique in his hearing the Word of God. This man was asking the right questions. Look in Acts chapter 8, and I want you to notice what he says at the end of verse number 34. Verse 34. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? This man is such a, a good case of hearing the Word of God because not only is he reading the Scripture, not only does he want to be taught and learn about Jesus, he's already asking the right questions. This one who just suffered, is he talking about himself or somebody else? Is this Isaiah talking or is Isaiah prophesying about somebody to come? You know what happens next? The Bible says Philip started at that point and preached Jesus to him. What a great question to ask. You know, you think of great questions and there's several in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9 verse number 6. Saul said, Lord, what would you have me to do? There's a man who's ready to hear. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. When they heard that they had just murdered their own Messiah, they were cut to the heart, and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then, one of the most beautiful questions ever asked. Acts 16, verses 30 and 31. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Like this man in Acts chapter 8. I've got to be asking the right questions. Lord, what do you want me to do? What must I do to be saved? Who's this talking about? And how can I understand it better? And what's the application of it to my life? And then, of course, as you think about Philip, he, of course, preached Jesus to him, that Christ was the fulfillment of Isaiah 53. He talked about Jesus suffering for all mankind. No doubt from the response the eunuch has, he taught about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus died for sin. He was buried in the grave and he arose the third day. And in the process of teaching that, Romans 6, 1 through 4, we die to sin, we're buried in baptism, and we rise out of it to walk in newness of life. And friend, there's confidence in the fact that Philip taught that for as he's teaching about Christ, he comes to a certain water. Look, there's water. What hinders me? Hinders you from what? Obeying Christ who died, was buried, and resurrected, and enacting that death, burial, and resurrection ends one's life. And so this man, he got the point about Jesus. You know, as Philip preached to this man, not only did he have to hear the Word of God, this man had to believe in Christ. And friend, belief in Christ is essential to salvation. Notice Acts chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. As they're traveling down the road, they come to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Notice the hindrance. Then Philip said, If, there's the condition, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he goes on to answer and say, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But friend, listen carefully. To be saved, it isn't enough just to hear or be asking the right questions. I've got to commit to it. If this is true, I'm going to believe it and I'm going to commit my life to it. That's what Jesus said we've got to do. Uh, Luke 9, 23, If any man desires to come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. This is essential to being saved is making that commitment to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But you know, along with hearing and believing, this man is a powerful example of making the good confession. You remember that confession. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before the Father who is in heaven. If you believe with all... Here's what Philip says to him. Here's water, what hinders me. If you believe with all your heart, you may. I believe. 
Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts chapter 8, verse number 37. Is it essential for a person to, with the mouth, make that statement? Let's listen to Romans 10, verse 10. With the heart, the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You know, in this man learning about the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus, there's no doubt he would have learned about repentance. Jesus died to sin. We've got to die to sin. Jesus was buried. We've got to be buried in water. He arose to walk in newness of life. No doubt that Philip taught this man that a changed life is part of becoming a Christian. Romans 6 verses 1 through 4 clearly teaches that idea. Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. And then to the idolatrous people. In Acts chapter 17, Paul said this, These times of ignorance... God once winked at or overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because He's appointed a day in which He'll judge the world in righteousness through the man who, whom He's ordained, and He's given assurance of it all to them all by raising Him from the dead. I must change my life. And the Ethiopian eunuch understood changes had to be made as well. Well, what else did this man realize was important? What else was he taught in God's plan of salvation? Friend, it's clear, this man was taught the importance of baptism. You can imagine sitting in the chariot. Philip is talking to this man about the Christ. I've read about this man, he's led to the slaughter. He opened not his mouth. Who is that? And he begins to tell him about Jesus. Jesus before Pilate. Jesus losing his life. Jesus on the cross. And no doubt this man says, I want to be a part of that. How do I become a part of that? Well, just as Jesus died, you've got to die. Die to sin. Just as Jesus was buried in the grave and He come up out of that, so you've got to be buried in water and you've got to arise to walk in newness of life. We know Philip taught that, that he taught the importance of baptism. For here's what the man said. He's teaching about Christ. They're traveling in the chariot. You can envision your mind. Up in the distance, there's water. Look, there's water. What hinders me from being baptized? You've told me how to get in Christ. I want to become a Christian. I appreciate what this man did for me. I've got sin and I need it addressed. Here's water. What's hindering me? He knew the importance of baptism. Whatever was hindering him, he wanted to get it out of the way so that he could get right with God. You know, we learned two very important things about baptism and God's plan of salvation from this man. We first learn that baptism is immersion and we learn that it's necessary to find the joy that can only be had in Christ. You remember the story, Acts chapter 8, verse 38. He confesses Christ. They stop the chariot. They both get out of the chariot. They both go down into the water. Philip baptizes him and he comes up out of the water. Here's a man traveling back to Ethiopia. Uh, why did they have to stop the chariot? Why did they both have to get out? Why did they both have to go down to the water and both come up out of the water? Friend, that's a clear example of immersion. John 3, verse 23. John was baptizing in Salome, in the area of Anon near Salome, because there was much water there. If baptism is a burial, Romans 6, 1 through 4, then a burial is a complete covering. And that's a picture of what God wants us to do. But friend, I also want you to notice this. In Acts chapter 8, as this man is baptized, the Bible says that man went on his way rejoicing. When he heard about Christ, when he believed that Jesus was that suffering servant, when he was willing to confess his faith in Christ, no doubt change the things in his life that are wrong, and when that culminated in him being baptized into Christ, that's when that man went on his way with true joy in Christ. Friend, baptism is what brings us that joy because we know our sins have been washed away. Acts 2 verse 38 tells us, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Saul was told in Acts 22 16, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. And Peter said, Baptism does now also save us. If sin separates me from God, and if baptism is the point in time when sins are washed away, there's no wonder this man went on his way rejoicing. He could rise up out of that watery grave of baptism with a clean slate, with all his past sin washed away. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says it so beautifully. This is what brought the man joy. If anyone is in Christ, and he just got in Christ, 
If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. Friend, as we think to our own lives and as we think about the joy of salvation, we ask you today, consider your own salvation experience. Did you obey the gospel as the Ethiopian eunuch did here? Did you hear just the Word of God? Did you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Were you willing to make that oral confession, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Did you repent, change your way of thinking and change your way of acting? And were you immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins? Friend, if you've never done that, we encourage you, we beg you today, become a Christian, obey the gospel, submit to the will of God, and I can assure you, you can have true joy that's only found in Jesus Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.